churches, mosques, temples, synagogues, folk all over the place, just uh, in their own faith tradition and understanding, are preaching and praying and acting uh, to respond to the continuous challenge of gun violence and mass incarceration. Uh, now, part of what we have decided to do here at The Way is uh, many of you, and many of you may not be aware, you may be aware that we have uh, some of the most uh, influential folk in the world. Amen. If you're influential in this country, you're influential in this world. Somebody say amen, right? Uh, right here in our congregation, when I was at the White House, I walked in and, and, and I'm looking around and I see members of our church. Amen. I'm in the White House. I'm like, hey. I got back to church, and another one of the members was like, you know, Pastor Brian, I was supposed to be at the White House, but I just couldn't make it because I had some other things. I was like, how important are you? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> you can find it all. I can't make this one out. I'm like, hey, 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 I'm like, you I'm like, hey, I'm like, hey, And I go down the laundry list. Some of y'all see got big corner offices and, and, and on, the, on the 50th floor in San Francisco and they're doing all kinds of amazing things. Some of you are working with our kids, making sure that they can uh, stay alive and free and learn and educate. We got superintendents in the room. We got all kinds of folk in the room. And I am just so blessed that when we do these kinds of activities, you just don't have to depend on what I have to say. Come on. Yes. But that God speaks to more people than just the pastor. Somebody say amen. Right? Yes. So part of what I'm doing is I'm going to take about 20 minutes of my sermon and I'm going to dedicate it to what we're doing this morning, the Live Free uh, uh, Sabbath event. And I'm going to call up an awesome Miley panel of men. Now this is uh, important to appreciate that... Uh, the president has just launched this initiative called My Brother's Keeper, and it is an initiative that is intended to address all of our sons and brothers, the men uh, in our communities who uh, certainly have structural barriers that are outside their control, right? And we want to figure out how do we remove those structural barriers and continue to do all the things that are necessary for our well-being and our success. So I thought it'd be wonderful for us to bring up a few of the uh, brothers who are doing national work as well as, well as local work to help uh, put this kind of program, whether it is actively coming out of the White House or the education system or working with our former incarcerated community, going to have them come up. They're going to be doing this at both services. We're recording this. We're going to edit it down and use it as a part of our training all across the country. This morning I was at Allen Temple Baptist Church and uh, was doing some stuff there. We have Bishop Noel Jones down at the City of Refuge is devoting his whole service to this today. Uh, Pastor uh, Kelvin Saul at Home United Methodist Church. Bishop Paul Morton, I was on the Word Network on Friday in Detroit. And uh, Pastor Deborah Morton just happened to be there. We got a chance to and then talk and hang out. And they're all excited. We got folk everywhere. And all of that trip originated out of this little old church too. So I say amen. 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 And I just is willing to use whoever has enough courage yes. and, 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 and radicality to believe that he can use you come on, and use me to change this country. So let us come on, put our hands together. Brother Mark Fieldpark of the Policy Link is coming up this morning. Dr. Antonio Sevier from the Education World of the efforts and these issues. Uh, let me just take a few minutes to go run through this slide real quick. Uh, go ahead. Uh, this is, again, what we are doing. Live Free Sabbath, uh, Preach, Pray, Act. Now, I want everybody to get your cell phones out. Get them out and get ready. Everybody, everybody, get your cell phones out. Your cell phones out. One of our actions is actually going to be using our cell phones to send an email to the president uh, to tell him we support this and we want him to uh, do some ban the box and other kinds of things that will actually support our sons and brothers. But go to the next slide. Uh, many of you may have heard of the prophets, amen? The prophets said a whole lot of interesting things uh, that always ended up getting them killed. Because they were speaking boldly on behalf of God. This is what the prophets said. I can't stand your religious meetings. I'm fed up with your conferences and conventions. 
I want nothing to do with your religious programs or projects, your pretentious slogans and goals. I'm sick of your fundraising schemes, your public relations and image making. I've had all I can take of your noisy ego music. When was the last time you sang to me? Amen. Some of you, I pray, can say a few minutes ago. Amen. But do you know what I want? I want justice. Oceans of it. I want fairness. Rivers of it. That's all I want. That's all I want. Next slide. We believe that this campaign, the Live Free campaign, is attempting to do three things. Raise awareness about the impact of gun violence and mass incarceration. All of you that have been here at The Way for a while know that we do this every several months. So we are actively making this a part of how we understand our faith walk. Reduce homicides in cities all across the United States using ceasefire and night walks. Amen. Uh, reduce incarceration rates and restore compassion for the rights or formerly incarcerated to vote, uh, get jobs, et cetera, et cetera. End the war on drugs, making sure that even though you may have committed a, a, a drug offense, that you're not getting uh, multiple life sentences like some folk have, sentences in prison for selling drugs while other folk get to go to Thunder Road Rehab right here in the Bay Area. Somebody say amen, right? Build healthy and safe communities with jobs and education. Next slide. So we were at the White House as I, I stand, and I'm going to get ready to pitch this first question to Brother Mark because he has been uh, helping to shape this initiative for the last several years, amen, leading an organization called the Alliance of Boys and Men of Color, coming out of one of the premier uh, policy uh, uh, think tanks led by people of color, uh, the, the, the Policy Link uh, Foundation or organization, and I'm just going to ask him, give us a sense, Brother Mark, you were there in the room, what was it like, where does this come from, and what is it intended to do? Uh, thank you, Pastor Mike. <coughs> it was electric. Um, there's, there's no denying that uh, it was an amazing experience uh, to be in the White House and to have the President speak so eloquently to the issues uh, affecting our community and more so the, the issues that we've been working on for, for so long. Uh, it was just a, a, a powerful moment for many of us. Um, this initiative uh, builds on the work that has been happening in communities throughout the country. Uh, it, the President is not necessarily planning to do anything wholly new. Um, what he's trying to do is harness the activity and the energy that's happening in communities all throughout the country and build on that, promote it, lift it up, and try to bring some coordination to the field and also to eliminate barriers. As Pastor Mike said, we know that the limitations that boys and men of color face in our communities are due to structural violence and structural racism. And because institutions um, have for so long uh, acted in a way that have excluded people, the president is recognizing that there are barriers within agencies, within governments, um, from, from local to the top, um, and, and trying to remove those barriers. Um, so he's organizing an interagency task force, um, making recommendations to each of the agencies so that they can do things that um, uh, create more opportunities for boys and women of color throughout the country in education and health and justice, et cetera. Great, great, great. Now, Brother Clarence Ford, you have been, uh, you know, one of these young men. You've been here a couple of times. You do some, some great, wonderful uh, work. Can, can you maybe just give us a sense of, uh, Brother, Brother Mark was talking about some of these barriers that exist, these structural barriers, challenges that boys and men of color face. As one of those young men, certainly, who have had your share of challenges, uh, now, uh, you are winning, praise God. Um, can you maybe just share a little bit of what some of those challenges look like for a young men your age and, and uh, what it took for you in order to uh, uh, get to a place now where you're, you're doing amazing work and maybe just kind of wrap up real quick and talk about what you do. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Again, my name is Clarence hey. Ford. I work with the Safe Return Project, which is a nonprofit out of Richmond, California. And, you know, basically, like, growing up, I don't know you guys probably look at me like, because I got this, this, this jacket on, but you know, I, I lived the street life, you know, I've been in prison and the whole nine, right? But like, growing up, like, as a young African male out here, like, you, you just gotta, like, either going to jail, run to prison, or and stand alive. That's like the obstacles that we face, right? Because we, we're really not taught to, to know otherwise. Like, the only way we're taught to make it out is basically by being an athlete or like a 
rather. Um, and that's just that's just one of the barriers that we face growing up. Um, me myself, like I used, I used to get good grades and everything, but like I never I never knew like academics was something I could excel in. I always thought like that's the only way I could make it out here. Right? Um, and you know, I I made a lot of mistakes, and you know. I'll just share my story. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Okay. All right, I, 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 I got incarcerated because I, I made a lot of mistakes. You know, I, did, I did three years, so it was rough, it was tough. Just been locked up and around a bunch of my brothers, they, they don't know. They don't, they don't realize like what we can do out here. You know what I mean? And but I, I, I did my time. You know, I made up, I did my time, whatever. Uh, I prayed, I prayed every night, I prayed for a purpose, I prayed for a purpose. And when I came home, like I still, like my friends, they were doing the same thing. And I got this job offering to do, like basically help my community, advocate for people coming home from prison and incarceration. And that was like the most wonderful opportunity I could have because I know what it's like, I could share my story, my experiences of what it's like been through to help my people that's coming home from incarceration. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, like, this, this is kind of like, like a gift in itself, you can do this, you know what I mean? Um, and then that way to me, I, I know I have a purpose, I have a sense of belonging here in this world. And since I've had the job, like, like, I, like I've been in school, my grades have been excelling, they, they excelling, and I've even changed my major. Like, I've changed my major in sociology. I applied to Florida University. Yeah. Like, I don't know who's going to go to Texas, but we're going to go to Texas. I, I, I'll say something quick, like, I, Brother Mike went for, he just did an interview for CNN, and, and I saw it, man, and I was just, I was so excited for that, because I, I watch CNN all the time, and, like, they don't highlight the real issues that's going on out here, you know what I mean? Like, the, the Newtown incident, okay, that happened, but growing up in, in the urban community, we see this all the time, like, mass killings, it just happens, it just happens throughout the days and the months, you know what I mean? And I just want to thank you for highlighting that, man, because we needed that up there. Um, okay. So let, I'm, I'm going to come back to you. Real, real quick, because Clarence, I met Clarence as a student, and a uh, and, uh, high school student, and um, you know, he, he'll tell you he was a piece of work. <laughs> and this smile he had now, he didn't have it. He, I, I, he, when he smiled like that, I couldn't see it because he had, it was a grill in his mouth. <laughs> <laughs> So, Brother Antonio, talk to us about education because uh, many of our young men are caught in what I call a maze, right? That is the only direction that they get out of the maze is usually into jails and graves. So, can you as an educator just talk a little bit about uh, why so many clearances in, the, in prison uh, before they get an opportunity? Because this clearance was there all along. Yeah, all the time. That's right? But for some reason, only a few of us, even Clarence couldn't see I was in him, only a few of us could see it. Why is it? What can we do? What, is, what are the challenges around education, particularly school to prison population? You can just highlight a little bit and maybe talk a little bit about what you do as well. So one of, one of the scariest things about all of this is how early it starts. Yes. Right? Yes. So we, we get used to seeing it when the young man is full grown, at least in size. But this starts in elementary school. Yes, it is. Okay? And so, I always say, I've never met a kid who didn't want to learn. Come on. Right? But somewhere along the line, they no longer want to learn what you're teaching them or how you're teaching them. Okay? So, at a certain point, they start checking out. It's a real gradual process. And I didn't see the whole process until I started working from elementary through high school. Right? Elementary school, they're still kind of smiley and they're doing little things or whatever, and they're kind of happy. The problem is sometimes you can't tell that they're not learning very much because they're still in a good mood, they're still happy. By middle school, you start to see some of the friction, right? Now I'm two years behind in my reading. Now the math is getting hard. And now I'm headed to puberty, right? And so the friction starts to happen. By ninth grade, this is when the dropouts really start. 
Now I'm three years behind. I don't feel good about myself. I got my adolescence coming on. And I'm just mad. Okay, and so then we start to notice. And by 10th grade, if you're not on track with algebra, hmm. right, which is one of the big barriers, yep. and your reading is behind, how do you go to a place every day for seven hours where you feel bad about yourself and no one gives you any positive feedback? You couldn't do that in your job, not willingly. So then the dropout starts out. Okay? And then what happens, you know, Clarence will, 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 will tell a story about it, but then we get our attention. They get our attention. And we say, well, we gotta lock them up. It's too late. They're bad people. Right? And so Clarence's story is instructive because even when you get to that point, you can be transformed. And if we have a different perspective of what we're doing with these young people, right? Prison at this point has become a place to warehouse them. Yes. It has nothing to do with rehabilitation. No, right. You're on your own if you get out. Okay. So the education investment we need to make is early. It's pre-K. Yes. All the way to high school. Mark, back to you. So talk about the initiative. There are you know, certain components of it, and I'd love for you just to highlight, you know, if you, if you can, uh, what, what each part of the initiative uh, the five, I think there are five pre k some literacy stuff, some, you know, uh, uh, school to business pipeline, violence, incarceration, jobs. Maybe just talk a little bit about what you imagine we as the faith community need to know in order for us to be uh, appropriately involved. Yes, yeah, so the My Brother's Keeper Initiative will have uh, five focus areas, and, and forgive me because I don't remember all five. But essentially, it, it tracks the developmental pipeline, of the, the, the life course, right? So mm -hmm. if you think about uh, what Brother Antonio said, you know, starting from very early on and then moving towards adulthood. Um, so the initiative will start with uh, trying to improve outcomes for boys and men uh, in the zero to five range, yes. um, uh, ensuring youth are, are, are reading by grade level. Um, by ensuring they're proficient in math and things of that nature, um, and also looking at um, just early childhood development as a, as a whole. Um, then the, the focus will be on um, reconnecting people back to services. Um, there's this class uh, or, or group of disconnected youth, you know, and, and disconnected basically means out of school, out of work. Um, and so from 18 to 24, um, the, the, the um, number of disconnected youth in our country is incredibly large, uh, and they're particularly um, or disproportionately boys and men of color. And so, if we can do something about decreasing that number, uh, bringing those young men uh, back into education, back into the workforce, um, then we can actually improve our economic outcomes as a country, um, because that's a broader tax base, more people working, more people um, so the initiative is is also trying to not only prevent, but it's also um, reconnecting um, and, and recovering young men, uh, such as Brother Clarence. You know, not necessarily just saying, "Oh, look, let's just focus on the babies." You know, it's, it's got to be, it's got to be more than that. You know, we have to we have to, in addition to preventing, we also have to recover people yes. um, and, and make sure they um, have opportunities because. Uh, brothers like Clarence are, are going to be fathers, mm -hmm. um, and, and they're going to have families, mm -hmm. right? We know that's going to happen, so we have to uh, provide them with the opportunities they need to be able to take care of their families and take care of their families in a strong way. Thank you, thank you. Clarence, uh, in closing, tell me a little bit of what you imagine we as uh, fathers, mothers, wives, partners, uh, Needs to, well, whoever, what can we do to support young men like yourself uh, who may find themselves in these situations? Um, and if there was one thing you could tell the president or the governor or the mayor to do to help boys and men of color be successful, what would that be? Oh man, it's just just being involved, man. Like I, I'm gonna share something with you guys. Uh, we we ran a campaign. It was called Investing People Not Prisons, mm -hmm. and. Um, Basically, the sheriff of Contra Costa County, he wanted to, 
he wanted to expand the West County Jail facility. So basically, he wanted to lock more people up. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And you know that's that's not the solution. You know, you have to invest in people. You have to invest in substance abuse programs, uh, employment opportunities, education opportunities, things like that. And basically, when, when we mobilized the community and we told up there, we we told the officials like. We don't want another jail in our backyard. We want you to invest in our community. That it was just, it was such an amazing experience. Like like I think five years back when I was laying on my bed and I was locked up, like I never thought I would be a part of something like this. You know, the experience is so wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, yeah. We get business in all. Like the, our senators and uh politicians, the people who represent us. It's up to us to make them yes. do their job. They're up to us, right? So we got to tell them what we want, what we need in our community. And all it takes is just getting involved. It's, it's as simple as that. It might be tedious, but it's worth it. Yes, come it's on. Worth it. It's worth it. Antonio, uh, hit, hit real quick why, uh, you know, obviously you 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 brother of uh, Latin descent, amen. Um, and there's a, often an effort to divide black and brown folk. <laughs> And I'd love you maybe just to speak on uh, what makes you feel like black and brown people united together, uh, and white for everybody, across our racial differences. Why is that important? And what do you think is one of the unique uh, challenges around this initiative that we pay attention to, particularly for our Latino brothers and sisters? Yeah, I mean, I, I've always been convinced that it won't happen unless black and brown get together. unite over this. Like, it's just numbers-wise, if nothing else. Huh. And then the commonality of the struggle. So, like some of the things, like we're, we're talking about incarceration here, right? And as we know, one of the things that happens is it destroys families because there's all these kids without fathers, mm -hmm. right? Uh, women without husbands. It just breaks up families. So the other thing that happens simultaneously is this whole integration debate that you hear about. And lots of times we don't draw the connections mm -hmm. because we, the reason why, part of the reason why people are so upset about all these deportations and about the incarceration immigrants, it's because you're breaking up families. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so I'm looking at Andrea Marta, we agree, and so there's an organizer extraordinaire over here, right? So, part of what's special about Andrea, right, she's one of the organizers who links these two struggles all the time, right? So it's important for us to sit in between <coughs> here and help people make connections, because not everyone knows this, Obama has deported more people than any president in Okay. Now, how many, I, how many is it? How many is it, Andrea? It'll be two million this coming week. Two million this coming week. Okay. And and it is not just Latino immigrants. Right. We have African, Caribbean, Asian immigrants as well. They're not deporting Canadians, oh even though in Arizona there are, are just as many Canadian immigrants there as Latino. Oh. They're not asking Canadians for their papers when they walk up and down the street. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the, and, and, and I don't know if you were here the, the, week, the week when Mike and, and Sermon talked about kind of the different levels of the different groups and how we feel about them, right? And so there's certain people who we see more human than other people, right? And the first step, the first subtle step at showing that we do not appreciate or love people is by criminalizing them, okay? So we move the goalposts in terms of what's legal and what's not legal, right? And so we have the highest incarceration rate of any nation in the history of the world, right? And right now we have the highest number of deportations that we've ever had, okay? The prison industry is growing at an incredible rate. Private prisons are expanding all over the country because the public prisons don't have enough beds. So we're making a big business to create more beds. And now we have all these lobbyists of private prison industries who are going to the governors and saying, Give us contracts. Oh, and part of the contract is you need to guarantee us where the 90% of the beds will be filled. So you're creating an incentive to lock people. Okay? So when you look at these beds, who's in them? Black and brown folks. Okay? But because when you have groups of people who don't have much, they're scrambling for the little bits of crumbs and they start fighting each other. Okay? So that's why part of our responsibility in order to get our collective uh, transformation, our collective you know, uh, progress, is we have to help each other make those 
connect those dots together. Brother Mark, close us out. What what some concrete things that you imagine? I know you wanted to chime in a few minutes ago, and then we'll we'll uh, all do a collective action, and then we'll see how the scriptures uh, really kind of seal all this together. For us. Yeah. So just building on the points that uh, brothers Antonio and Clarence made, um, we're never going to get out of this unless we mobilize and unless we. Uh, engage and use political advocacy as a strategy. Um, we can we can service all day all day long. We can, we can provide services all day long, um, and, and I think those services are are, are critical. Um, but at the end of the day, we have to change the structural landscape, mm -hmm. and we have to change the way the rules. Um, of, of the game on play. Mm -hmm. and, and we won't be able to do that unless we engage in political advocacy. And so the, the, the Life Lines to Healing campaign is doing some wonderful work nationally. Um, uh, locally here, at, at least in California, you have the Alliance for Boys and Men of Color, um, which is a, a statewide network. And notice I said for Boys and Men of Color, not of Boys and Men of Color. So that means anybody can be mm -hmm. part of it, anybody yeah. can be for it. Um, white, women, whoever, can be for boys and men of color. Um, and, and what we try to do is lift up solidarity and inclusion as a principle, right? So everybody has a, has a place in this, in this movement. Everybody has a role to play. Um, and so Alliance for Boys and Men of Color, if you text, if you have your smartphones out, because people were texting earlier, if you text BMOC to 67076, Six seven zero seven six. You can get uh, action alerts and messages. Um, there's also a Twitter. You can follow there at Alliance um, or BMOC. Um, there's a website, etc. So get engaged. Learn more about what's happening. Um, like I said, the president's initiative is basically building on the initiatives that are already in existence. Lifelines of Healing, the Alliance for Boys and Men of Color. There's also um, an Institute for Black Male Achievement. Um, you can you can get you can get engaged. You can learn more about all of these efforts and, and, and get connected to um, making real change in your own communities um, soon. What I love about this initiative is it is an opportunity for us to make it what we want it to be. Yeah. It's a framework, and now we must build the house. Is how I've been talking about. It. So whatever you want in your house, I mean, no, you put it in your house. Yes. I don't know how many of us actually built our house. Like with our own hands, maybe. Oh, not even Brother Bill. That's okay. <laughs> but when you walked in your house, did you put in your house what you wanted to be in your house? You put the kind of uh, uh, brands you wanted in your house, color schemes. So we are saying to our president, whom we love and support, thank you for building a framework. Now, this is what we want in our house. We want you to ban the box on federal job applications. So our men and women can come home and not have to immediately disclose that they just come home from jail. Give them all the opportunity to vote after they serve their time. Make sure that they have the ability to live in public housing so they don't have to sleep out on the streets. And if they have a drug addiction, make sure they can get treatment and not go back to jail. Reasonable things, right? So take out your cell phones right now and text Lifelines or live free. Live free is eight letters. Lifeline is nine letters. Whichever one you want to text. Go to the last slide, brother. Uh, uh, uh. Text Lifelines to six nine eight six six, and you should get a link back that will actually plug you into our live free email system that will automatically send the president an email. Declaring that people of faith, we're getting 10,000 folk all across the country do this today. When they get into the White House tomorrow, we want them to know that over the weekend, 10,000 people of faith preached, prayed, and acted uh, to ask and support this initiative and to ask that it has what we want in there. If, if, if I need a, a, a one of those beds that, that adjust to my back, I want a cop when I show up to my bedroom. Somebody say amen, right? I want what we need in the house. Text Lifelines to 69866 and, and it'll, it'll start to link in you into some of these things. This is one thing people of faith can do. We will plan a boot camp, two days of training. 
I think it is May 2nd through the 3rd here in the Bay Area. We're going to invite all of us to go and get trained on these strategies in the name of the Lord. Put your hands together for this awesome Uh, and I want to say one last thing. Um, say it I, quick. I say like, <laughs> I got a African American here. But like, it's, the, the Investing People Not Prince campaign that I was talking about, it was black and Latinos who united to defeat that jealous man. So when black and Latinos get together, it is so powerful. Yeah. So we got to work together. I don't come up in our own issues, but when we work together, we can move mountains. That's cool.